I am so excited to begin our new class series. This one is titled Pentecost and Persecution, and it tells the story of what happens during the year or two following Jesus' resurrection. The disciples have got to be absolutely stunned by all that's happened. Each of the four Gospels ends differently. Mark ends earliest in the story, immediately after the resurrection of Jesus. Luke goes a bit further, telling how Jesus joins two of the disciples on the afternoon of Easter Sunday as they trudge home to Emmaus. Then both Luke and John tell how Jesus suddenly appears later that same day in a locked room where the disciples are hiding. John says it's at that time that Jesus breathes on the disciples and tells them, receive the Holy Spirit, endowing them with the power necessary to carry on their mission without him. John tells how Jesus comes out to meet the disciples as they come in from a long night of unsuccessful fishing and how he prepares breakfast for them and eats with them. Both Matthew and Luke tell how the disciples go to meet Jesus on a mountain in Galilee. And Matthew says it's there, not in that locked room, that Jesus tells the disciples to go make disciples of all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and telling them he will be with them to the end of the age. But Luke differs here as well. He says Jesus just tells them to wait in Jerusalem until they're clothed with power from above. And it is only in Luke that we have the story of the ascension of Jesus into heaven. This is where Luke leaves off in his gospel. And it is exactly where he picks up in his second book, Acts of the Apostles. But before we dive into the story, there's something I want to clear up. We do not know for sure who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Acts. All of these books are anonymous. So what exactly is the state of the Bible at this moment in time? When were the Gospels and Acts written, and who wrote them? The Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible is called the Septuagint, the LXX for short. It was started around 130 years BCE with a translation of the law, the first segment of the Hebrew Bible. And then it was steadily expanded over the ensuing 200 years to include the prophets and finally the writings. The writings include, you know, kind of everything else, the Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, Daniel, Esther, Ruth, Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles. At the time of Jesus, only the law, the prophets, and the Psalms were for sure included. Although these other books in the writings were definitely known and in circulation, it isn't until well into the second century, long after Jesus, that the list of writings to be included in the Hebrew Bible is finally solidified. Christians took even longer to finalize their Old Testament, over 1,500 years, and even then, the various Christian denominations have very different lists of the books to be considered canon. So if this is the state of the Old Testament, where did we stand at this point with the New Testament? Well, as you can imagine, there isn't a New Testament per se. At first, of course, this stuff is all being lived, so there's nothing but word of mouth. It's, it's happening real time. Then later in the first century, there are various letters and books of the apostles circulating among believers. And this lack of definition of a canon doesn't seem to bother anyone. The believers and the early churches don't need a list of which books are canon because they don't really see the letters of the early apostles as scripture in the first place. They're just letters of advice and teaching. The push for a final New Testament canon doesn't happen for hundreds 
of years. Instead, the early church grows up with the letters of the apostles and other people floating around. Various letters and books that were read, told orally, and gradually gathered into collections by the church leaders. <laughs> the early church leaders are called elders and bishops. They're appointed by the apostles originally, many of them by Paul himself. But soon there is a division between these church fathers. A consensus is needed to determine what is true Christianity and what is not. What is Christian behavior and what is not? In the books of the New Testament that we have now, we see the various churches asking Paul these sorts of questions. But after Paul's death, they have to rely on copies of his letters and the writings of the other apostles. As you can imagine, no one has a definitive collection of the letters and teachings of the apostles. Different people have different bits and people are adding their own strong opinions. There is so much for the early church leaders to figure out. People have lots of questions about what exactly it means to be a follower of the way of Christ. Some of these early church leaders have been students of the apostles themselves, and their opinions carried a lot of weight. But there are other heavy hitters in the mix. For example, a guy named Marcion has one of the largest libraries of the apostles' writings. But he takes the stance that Jesus completely supersedes the Old Testament and that the God of Jesus is a different God than the creator in the Old Testament. In fact, he views the creator as evil and he rejects all of the Old Testament. He himself is eventually rejected by the other church leaders as a heretic, but even that doesn't happen until more than a hundred years after Christ. Another main criterion used by church leaders to determine which letters and books to include in the New Testament is whether the material in question is helpful in governing the church. There are books in the Bible that were supposedly written by Paul, but we now know were not. And even back then, the church fathers suspected as much. But the books were useful for church governance, so they kept them in. For example, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus were almost certainly not written by Paul. But it is in these writings that we find the church governance passages about the acceptable characteristics of elders and deacons, specifically that they should be male and have only one wife and have obedient children. And it's also where we find the rejection and suppression of women in leadership in the church. Neither Jesus nor Paul, in the letters he actually did write, rejected or suppressed women. Although Paul certainly chastised a woman or two in his writings, he did the same to some of the men, and he drew valued leaders from both sexes. So what are the other writings the church leaders utilized during the first and second centuries? Well, one of the most popular ones is the Diatessaron by a guy named Tatian. It is a harmony of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A harmony is a writing that combines the four Gospels into a single narrative. Tatian's is immensely popular in the second century. And he, you know, kind of stitches it together by adding some material and narrative of his own, as well as stories from other sources. Another popular writing is The Shepherd of Erma, which is a series of visions in which a dead woman appears to a shepherd and accuses him of having impure thoughts about her while he was married. In successive visions, she instructs him on proper living. Her instruction is then followed by instruction from an angel. They also have access to material that is lost to us entirely, such as at, at least one letter to the church in Laodicea. Uh, 
they have access to writings of Gnostic Christians who went down a rabbit trail early on and ended up being determined to be heretics. Gnosis in Greek is the word for knowledge, and they are a huge influence in the early church, resulting in many divisions and much confusion. I want to give a shout out to the book Early Christianity and Its Sacred Literature by MacDonald and Porter, Hendrickson Publishers, copyrighted in 2000. While the information I'm presenting here was gathered from many, many sources, I appreciate their organization and presentation of the material, and I've followed their work on pages 611 through 622 in their chapter on the origins of the Christian Bible. Later in the second century, a group called the Montanists arise. They're pretty right-wing and insist on strict asceticism, penitence, an end-time focus, especially on Revelation, and reliance on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Like most of these other folks, the Montanists don't believe the, the apostles had the last say, and they're quite happy to add to the collection of sacred writings themselves. And of course, swimming in all this and the many, many other similar writings floating around at the time, we have the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, plus Acts, the writings of Paul, people who said they were Paul, and the others that did make it into the final list of canonical writings. The early church leaders used all of these writings and others, and they disagreed with each other over them all the time. Some of the church fathers rejected the Montanists and the Gnostics, while others rejected the Gospel of John and Revelation. And at the same time, some accepted Barnabas and the Apocalypse of Peter, while others rejected these particular writings and others. It's a real soup pot of sources, and we don't really know who wrote most of them. Even though the Gospels bear the names of some of the apostles, Matthew and Mark were unlikely to have been written by these men. Mark, for sure, has a much more elaborate literary structure than an uneducated Galilean would be capable of writing. And the author of Mark is a native Greek speaker, which the disciple almost assuredly was not. The author may not have even been a disciple, but only a secretary to Peter, for example. Matthew was an opportunist, a tax collector, an extortionist, an employee of Rome. And yet the author of that gospel displays a deep, and devout knowledge of Hebrew scripture. We have no idea who Luke was. There is a Luke mentioned in one of Paul's letters, but there's no mention in either the Gospel of Luke or of Acts that they were written by someone named Luke. John, on the other hand, almost certainly did write his Gospel and Revelation, but not 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So why did we name the Gospels after Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Tradition, tradition, dun, 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 tradition. Around 170 common era, one of the church leaders named Irenaeus wrote a definitive work attacking what he saw as the heresies that were rampant in the Christian community by this time. And his work became foundational to the rejection of many of those writings. He also listed the four gospels by name, based presumably on current usage, like this is what people called these. And these are the names that have stuck. But all of these writings are anonymous, truly. So why did Irenaeus get to name them? Well, for one thing, he wasn't the only one calling them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but there's another reason. As it turns out, Irenaeus 
was a student of Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, who was martyred in 155 CE. Polycarp was a student of John. Yes, that John, the Apostle John, who became the Bishop of Ephesus. And John, as you know, was taught by Jesus. You can't get a better pedigree than that. And even though Irenaeus lives 150 years after Christ, he uses this pedigree to his advantage, wielding tremendous power and authority in the early church in the years after the deaths of the apostles. There are many other men like Irenaeus who come to be known as the, quote, church fathers, and they are the ones who eventually settle on the books of the New Testament. But that doesn't happen until well into the fourth century. What likely brings the discussion to a head are two events that happen one right after the other. The first is the persecution of Christians in the early fourth century, when the emperor Diocletian required Christians to burn their sacred books. The Christians have to figure out which books to burn in order to do this, right? Which books are their sacred books? Then, in a dramatic turnaround under Emperor Constantine, Christianity becomes the official religion of the state. Around 320 Common Era, Constantine begins insisting that the new state religion will be consistent and clearly be defined. And so it is under pressure from him that the church develops its various statements of faith, the famous creeds we still use today. And it is Constantine who asks another one of the church fathers, a guy named Eusebius, to give him a list of Christianity's 50 sacred books. Now Eusebius, who had probably baptized Constantine, gives him a list that is divided into four categories books that are definitely canon, a few that are disputed, but that most people recognize as canon, books that are rejected as canon, but are still useful, and a sample listing of heretical books. As for the canon, Eusebius includes the Gospels, Acts, all of the letters of Paul, including Hebrews, 1 John, 1 Peter, and Revelation. He notes that although he personally believes Hebrews to be authentically Pauline, you know, re truly written by Paul, that that claim is disputed by others. For Eusebius, the disputed books include James, Jude, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and a book called the Gospel of Hebrews, which we do not have a copy of. The rejected books, which he considered still useful for Christians to read privately, are the Acts of Paul, the Shepherd of Herma, the Apocalypse of Peter, Barnabas, Teachings of the Apostles, and Revelation. He literally couldn't decide whether Revelation should be in the canon or not. So he put it in both places with a little note that people were divided over it since there were serious questions, even back then, as to whether the Apostle John even wrote it or whether it was written by some other John or was even an outright forgery. Heretical material listed by Eusebius includes many of the various gospels and other writings that are floating around at the time that claim to be written by the apostles, but clearly are not. This could be said about some of the rejected books, but what makes these particular ones heretical to Eusebius is their bad theology in addition to being of doubtful origin. You can see that our current New Testament is comprised of both Eusebius's list of canon as well as his list of disputed books with the single exception of the Gospel of Hebrews, which we no longer have. Interesting, huh? And this particular list doesn't even get made until the fourth century. And this 
is definitely not the only list out there. Many other groups and church fathers have their own lists at this time. In coming up with their lists, it seems that Eusebius and the other church fathers used three basic criteria to gauge the usefulness and authenticity of a particular book. First, was the book written by an apostle, or at least did they think it probably was? They didn't always get this right. And second, did the theology seem consistent with that accepted by the church? This is called being orthodox as opposed to being heretical. It's easier to tell this with some books than others. And of course, orthodoxy is defined by these particular church fathers within their particular culture and time. And third, did the church already consider the book authoritative? In other words, were folks already using it as canon? Again, this criterion would be heavily influenced by the culture, time, and specific controversies facing the fourth century church. We might make different choices today. There's one more important piece of information you need for your backpack as we launch this series. As you know, Jesus dies around 30 Common Era, and the temple is destroyed by the Romans in 70 Common Era. Since none of the Gospels mention the raising of the temple, which was a huge catastrophic event, even bigger than 9-11 was to us, we have to assume that since they didn't mention it, the Gospels were all written prior to 70 Common Era. The letters of Paul, on the other hand, can be dated from around 46 Common Era to about 60 Common Era based on the events and people involved. So you can see that Paul did not have the benefit of the Gospels. He neither met Jesus in real life nor is it likely that he read the gospel accounts of Jesus' teachings. That's going to become very important, and I'll remind you of this later. And because Paul's original letters were regional in nature and were not collected and compiled until some years later, the gospel writers did not have access to Paul's writings either. There was some interaction between Paul and the apostles during their lifetimes, but it was very limited and seems to be mostly focused on how to deal with the influx of Gentiles to the Christian faith. So now that we're forewarned, let's dive back into our story and see what happens to the disciples in the weeks after Jesus leaves. Luke begins Acts of the Apostles at the ascension of Jesus, the same place he ended his gospel. He explains that this is the second book he's written for his patron, Theophilus, who is apparently a Greek Gentile convert. Luke says that his first book, which we call the Gospel of Luke, was all about Jesus and his teachings, and it's here that he picks up his storyline. He says the disciples see Jesus over a period of 40 days after his resurrection and that he speaks to them about the kingdom of God. One day, while Jesus is eating with them, he tells them, stay in Jerusalem and wait for what I told you the Father has promised. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in just a few days. The disciples don't seem to particularly care about that. They say, yeah, but are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? <laughs> and Jesus says, guys, that's not for you to know. What you do need to know is that once the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It was some time after this, Luke says, when Jesus and the disciples are on the Mount of Olives, that Jesus is taken up into the clouds before their very eyes. The disciples are gobsmacked and are standing there looking up at the sky with their mouths hanging open when suddenly they notice two men dressed in white standing with them. <laughs> 
The men say, Galileans, why are you standing around looking up at the sky? This very Jesus, the one you saw taken up into heaven, will come back in the same way. So the disciples make tracks for Jerusalem and head straight for the upper room where they are staying. And there the 11 men, the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers gather for prayer over the ensuing days. It's interesting to me that Jesus' brothers finally appear in the picture. They were noticeably absent during all of the accounts of the crucifixion. And they've actually been overtly hostile throughout Jesus' ministry. I wonder if the resurrection changed their minds. We don't know what caused their turnaround, but we do know that Jesus' brother James goes on to become a respected leader in the baby church. We'll hear more of James' story later. In Luke's gospel, he says the believers are continually in the temple praising God, but they're also still reeling from Judas's betrayal. Finally, Peter stands up among them. Luke says there's about 120 believers present. And Peter says, you know that Judas was one of us. You know that the Psalms foretold that one of us would desert his place and that his place would need to be filled by someone else. Therefore, let us choose someone who has been with us the whole time, from the beginning with John's baptism, all the way through to the resurrection. And so they nominate two men, Joseph, who is also called Barsabbas or Justice, and Matthias. Then they pray, saying, Lord, you know all hearts. Show us which one of these is the one you have chosen to take Judas's place. And after praying, they cast lots, basically flip a coin, and the lot falls to Matthias. And so Matthias becomes one of the 12 apostles. And we never hear from him again which goes to show how much of the story the early church is missing. People simply weren't writing this stuff down. Speaking of writing things down, let's use our breakout time to give some thought to the books that made it into the Bible and the ones that didn't. All righty. So what, what'd y'all talk about? What'd you think? We talked a little bit about how um, there's certain, certain books like Corinthians or Hebrews that, that you spend a little more time in and you're more familiar with. And these other books, it's hard to know how to address these questions because you don't spend time there unless you're seeking it out personally. It's not where the church focuses. It's not where the lessons tend to be. We all are very familiar with First and Second Corinthians and Hebrews because those are guides to us. Right. And we have that indoctrinated into us over and over repeatedly. It's the main stream of what is discussed. But I cannot, for the life of me, quote you something out of Second John. Right. right. I have no clue. Well, and I said I was I was I said I was a little bit blown away by some of the information that you provided us this morning because um, I've never really dug that much into. I mean, I knew some of the authors weren't there, but you know, I've always felt that Revelation is such a departure in message and style and everything. And then, so the here that it was, it didn't you say it was one of the ones that barely skated through? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, there was, even at the time he made the list, he put it in, yeah, you, half of us think we should include it and half of us don't think we should include it and it should, you know, be not wow. used and, and it finally made the cut, but it was definitely right. on the bubble, like, you know, 300 years after Christ. It was probably a very close vote. I would think it was a very close vote because it is apocalyptic literature. They would have been familiar with what that was. It was a genre. Yeah. It's like science, science fiction. It has a point, you know, but um, I can certainly see why it was on the bubble. And yet we have whole 
chunks of Christianity that just live and die by the words in that particular book. I think it's not necessarily, I forget the words you just used to describe it. I think it's, you said sci-fi. I think it's more like a horror book. (laughs) You know? Well, she said apocalyptic. Yeah. 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 So I didn't, we got kind of going there, but I was going to share, I have always been taught that the Bible was the inspired word of God. Same here. And I learned some of this from my husband, but you took it a little bit deeper, Gail. Yes. A little more tangible. Yeah. So I never really questioned who was who and what was the legitimacy. And I also shared that years and years ago, Anne shared with me, because I didn't know this, that there were books in the Bible um, with women that have just been kind of tossed out. (laughs) <laughs> there are there are definitely places in the manuscripts where we can see and we're gonna I'm, i'll point one out to you when we get to it where we can see that a woman's name the ending you know how we tend to end a woman's name with an a and a man's name with an o just generally right. okay well we can see in the manuscript that it the, the a was scratched out and the o was put up there you know, that uh, kind of thing. You know it just there were probably many instances similar to that yeah and i've kind of pointed out as we've gone along um places where it appears that the woman might have been erased um and one of the most recent ones was in our last class series when i was talking about the road to emmaus and clopas's wife mary uh, was probably the second disciple right huh well and another place we went thanks to one of our members opening the door on it, was how women are marginalized in so many of these books. And it's a very patriarchal reinforcement, you know, sort of like, and and I brought up that someone I know and love very much is of the inclination toward promise keepers where it's God, the man, the wife, the children. And as I have observed this, I see that it not only slights the wife and children in their being lesser than, but it puts an enormous responsibility on the man to handle everything. Instead of sharing the burden with his partner, and resting it on God together. Rhonda, you had something. Well, we she said talk about that. We started out with, and you know, we read through the thing, and we're talking about you know the context. You talked about the context, and we all have. And we were we spent quite a bit of our time on the women too. The fact that women are just in you know people Where use the they? Bible to for women to just be. You know, you, some say you can't be preachers, you can't, you know, and somebody shared a story about a man said, woman doesn't even belong in the temple. Yeah. So I want to, let's, since both groups <laughs> landed there, let's talk about that for a second. Um, because um, if you were in the series where we went through the gospels that we just finished that class series you saw lots of evidence of women in leadership yes. with Jesus, right? Lots of it. And we just saw in, uh, or we didn't, we didn't see in today's lesson. I saw in the lesson that I wrote this week, that, <laughs> that we were going to do next week that, um, that the room where the Holy spirit falls on the disciples had women in it as far as I can tell, and yet they're not mentioned. And so we start out with Jesus and we move forward through Paul's ministry. And in Paul's ministry, we are going to find lots of women, just like Jesus had, women supporters, women disciples, women leaders. There's a slew of them. And then at some, and we also, I think at one point in one of the 
classes a while back, we looked at um, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And we saw how she was portrayed as a leader among the um, disciples in that gospel, even though the content was theologically suspect, the, the dynamics of the group interaction indicated that she was a leader. And I mean, you can hardly read the gospels without realizing Mary Magdalene was a leader right. among the disciples, right? Right. So, so Jesus and Paul both, in their actions, in their ministries, elevated women to roles of leadership yes and then something happened in the two or three hundred years after that as the church hierarchy began to coalesce as there needed to be church governance as people needed to make rules the, the elders and bishops that Paul appointed as far as we know were all men and and somehow the the whole Christian attitude began to coalesce around patriarchy. Well, let me let me ask this. I, I you said something happened. Uh, it was always a patriarchal society, was it not? It was so, the Jewish society always was patriarchal. Yeah, and and so it was that society, that culture that had to basically decide what was canon and also uh, vote on what books and everything. And, and it, it seems to me like it's, it, it's not, it was not something different. It was just that this same patriarchal society uh, and culture had to sort of uh, decide what Christianity was all about. They're the ones that decided it. Mm -hmm. So that seems like that's how that's how women got left out. We didn't have any women emperors, did we? Um, no. So once you start talking about governance, you don't get women senators, you don't get women governors, you don't get women emperors. So throughout the entire ancient world, as you point out, Woody, the norm was the patriarchy ruled and the women submitted. That was not the norm for Jesus and Paul in their ministries. They opened up to women. And so there was like this little glimpse, you know, of freedom and um, value. And then as after the apostles died and Paul died and, and the church was beginning to write its rules about what's orthodox and what's heresy and how do you govern and whatnot, then what books do they pick to include in the canon? They are including the ones that are very specific about yep. the male at the top, the wife yep. in, is in submission, the children are, in, are obedient, slaves obey your masters. You know, they, also, they picked those. Gail, Martha brought up something that was very interesting when we were in our group about how so many of the books were about governance and behavior as yes. to how to fly under the Roman radar and allow them to establish their church. So that too may factor into that. That's a terrific point, because in this period, in these ensuing couple of hundred years, there have been intense persecutions of the Christians under various of the emperors. So that is a point well taken. They were just trying to survive, to fit in, to not stand out. Yeah. I think it, it two things very quickly. First, I want to thank Woody because he is the person who brought the subject up in our group for taking up our fight. And two, it has never made any sense to me that God would create a companion for Adam to be a mute grunt. I mean, that makes, and okay. And also ironically, when you talk about the Jewish faith, you're known to be Jewish by your mother, not your father. So that's a little ironic. And lastly, there's always more women than men on the earth. Why are we putting up with this? Okay, I'm done. <laughs>
<laughs> I I don't know if I've shared this with you all um, before, uh, but it doesn't hurt to to repeat it. Um, but when God created a helpmeet for Adam, that word is a particular Hebrew word that does not mean submissive partner. It is a word that means strong protector. Eve was created to be a warrior protector, strong strength for Adam. It's never, I've never heard it explained, but I agree. One of these days, we're going to get Martha to to do a thing on women, um, and that's you know that's kind of part of it is is that God in the beginning created women to be a force of nature, <laughs> and I think we are. Well, uh, and a lot of times you'll hear like that gives someone else purpose you know like when you have your children you have purpose when you take a mate you have purpose because it's not just yourself it's also your partner that you champion and feel strongly for and are there for and face the world with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you i saw you raise your hand yeah um is this is the story of Lilith not in the Christian roles at all? It 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 correct. It is one of the um, extra biblical stories. I, I'm tell I'm telling you that this. I, I'm hoping it was eye opening for you to see how much yes. material is out there and was out there. And when somebody comes to me and said, "Oh, God dictated every word that is in our." you know, New Testament, I'm thinking you apparently have not done much study. <laughs> I do believe scripture is divinely inspired. I think God speaks through all of us. I think God speaks through wit written word and through human beings. I think what who we are is far more important to the person on our right or on our left and what we believe is in, is in the Bible. Um, so I, I, I wanted to just frame this for you so that you know, as we go through, and as we go through these books, we will, I will point out to you as these different books come up, um, what is in them and, and why scholars may or may not think this book was written by Paul or and and if it was the point is that if it wasn't written by Paul actually then the early church fathers would have excluded it from the canon oh mm -hmm. so then they have to say it's by Paul so it's it's it, it, and so it's important to know I think which books scholars will tell you are you know 50 50 like colossians and ephesians where you could come down on either side and which books are like we're pretty pretty darn sure <laughs> paul didn't write these like first and second timothy titus second thessalonians and hebrews because if the early church fathers had known that those wouldn't have made it into the bible and those are the books um the the first and second timothy and titus are are the ones all about the structure and governance of the church and women on the bottom and all the things donna did you have something to say well, i was just in that realm of what you were saying uh with the that somebody was talking about the infallible word and people just taking everything that it is what it is I mean, all these people that made these decisions of which books went in and which books went out, you know, somewhere along the way, I think it was always presented 
because they're praying about it and God inspired them to know which things were supposed to be there. So it kind of flowed on down that once they picked, they are saying, this is what God told us. Basically. And at that point, you just never you know, questioned it. But I, you're, the interesting information, I wondered, how did it ever get out about how they decided? <laughs> because to me, that was those, they're holed away somewhere and they're making this thing and you know, you're going to draw straws and see which books go in. They, now, uh, uh, yeah, it's the historians, and they, and these men wrote down what the what their rationale was. They would write books and treatises um, okay. about why they thought what they thought, and then somebody else would write his back in response. And they would have these big conferences that really Constantine called them together for to make, to force them to get on the same page, kind of right. literally. Um, if if Constantine hadn't forced the issue, uh, it, it never would have been settled. I don't think. And I learned a whole lot. Constantine's a whole other whole. <laughs> Him and his mom. That's right. They, Him and his mom. They want to get everybody on the same on the same plate there. So yeah. So the way that I'm going to present material is going to I'm going to frame it in acts. I'm going to interleave the books of Paul that we know were written by Paul so that we get a feel for who Paul is and what he actually thought and did. And after we're done with Acts, then we'll have a series on, and we'll, we'll probably have different series in Acts, um, uh, like the first missionary journey is a thing and the second missionary journey is a thing it's a, and the third missionary journey is a thing um so i will divide those all into different class series because they're different things but when we're done then we will take in order the books as they appear on this page we will do class series where we look at colossians and ephesians and kind of think about how they compare with what we already know about Paul at that point and kind of think about what do we think um, about those two bits. And then we'll move on to um, Timothy, Titus, second Thessalonians, uh, those books and probably do those together uh, and talk about now those, how different or alike they are from the Colossians and Ephesians and from Paul. And then we'll look at Hebrews and then we'll do James, Jude, Peter, first, second, and, first and second, Peter, first and second and third, John, those all, we'll do all those together. Those are little teeny tiny things. Um, we'll do those all together. You'll, you will start to see some of the weird stuff and why those were on the bubble, even for these church fathers. They were like, eh, I don't know if we should include those or not. And lastly, we'll do Revelation. I'm but looking I, forward to it. Yeah, because it's just a different way of ordering the material and looking at it kind of by the person who wrote it. I'm trying to get our arms around who Paul is and what he really thought and did rather than taking it, you know, in the in the Bible, they put it in order of how big the book was. What kind of order is that? That makes no sense. So hopefully- yeah, it, Wow. Is, is the are the book are the additional books that are in the Catholic Bible in the Old Testament? Yeah, they're in between the right, yes, right. they're in the Old Testament, and they cover the okay. period of years in between the Old Testament and the New. Okay, and that, they have a and they have apocalyptic stuff in them, similar to Revelation. It's just this you know, and okay. this angel comes down in a horse and he you know smites people and. Yeah, and the we guys had miraculously <laughs> come, you know, that's just all this. Well, that was just one of my Baptist revelations as I grew up of like at the half price bookstore, there's a separate Catholic Bible. Why <laughs> <do that? laughs> Who knew, right? You know, so like, wait a minute. <laughs> anyway. Right. Right. And I don't want to in any way leave you with the idea that I do not have reverence for the Bible. I love the Bible. And even in these books that are questionable, 
there the Holy Spirit can be found in there. I'm going to take some of the stuff that is cultural with a grain of salt. All right. Some of this patriarchal stuff, eh, maybe not so much, but there's some real kernels of truth. And even as we saw in the lesson today, Eusebia said, you know, these books, they're, they're not great, but they, they're useful. They're just not canon. <laughs> so I think that if you come away from today with anything, it's that the lines are fuzzy here and you get to participate in deciding what is the voice of God and what is not. Okay. All right. We will end there for today. Um, unless anybody has another observation or something. Okay. It was good. We'll call it a day. And next week, it's Pentecost. Woohoo! See you later. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.